So there's been a lot of chatter about Amazon's conduct in, first of all, submitting or asking for proposals on its second headquarters. In other words, asking for tax incentives uh, and forcing cities and counties to compete in order to get its business and its, you know, n its number of jobs, anywhere between 10 and 30,000. Um, and what happened was uh, New York City won the proposal, uh, but then Amazon backed out over many, many different issues. Uh, we don't know exactly what, but ultimately uh, this is a situation where the winner may have actually lost. But that's not exactly true. And that's what a lot of politicians are trying to say right now. But I don't think they're characterizing the issue properly. So let's try to characterize the issue properly. Um, first of all, most business uh, in America is not necessarily a race to the bottom. It's more, you know, which cities and counties and states want to engage in a public-private partnership that makes both parties win. So the idea being is, you know, one of the false claims is that cities were going to give Amazon $3 billion. Um, and that's just not true. There's no pot of money that's laying around uh, for counties to and cities, most of whom are in, in are running deficits um, or sorry, in debt. They're not running deficits. Cities and, and, and counties usually uh, have to you know have a balanced budget. It's the states that are typically in positions where they can borrow as much money as the market will give them. Um, whereas cities, every year, they have to submit a balanced budget. Um, so a lot of times when I say debt, a lot of times that's done by issuing debt, by issuing bonds. So they might have your local city um, or, or your local police department, um, firefighters, uh, city, you know, planning commission, um, all these different things, you know, community centers, uh, water um, sanitation, all these things you know that go into making a city um, they might look like they have a balanced budget, but if you look deeper, um, you know, they might be borrowing money uh, in order to sustain whatever promises they've made to their own employees uh, in the form of pensions, for example, um, or just in terms of growth. Um, there might be, there are cities, um, not just in the U.S., but in China, where the local cities have promised to build X number of housing uh, complexes, and, and they're just sitting there because that money and the market um, isn't really, it, it's, it's no longer expecting the same return on investment that, you know, at in year four that it did in year one or in year zero. So um, the, the real issue here is, you know, number one, let's try to frame the issue properly so that we can discuss it, you know, in a sane, rational way. Number one, there's no pot of money. Number two, the question is, uh, you know, if, if Amazon or any company decides to show up, to your city, what is it that you have to convince or give the, the, the company in exchange for these jobs where the individuals that get these jobs will pay taxes? Um, you know, so typically what ends up happening is I have, a, you know, a billion dollars. I want to build something, a facility, a um, distribution center, um, whatnot. And ultimately, you know, that's going to cost me money. So you, the city, say, well, go ahead and build it because right now there's nothing there. And so we, once you build something there using your money, which typically is financed by a bank, companies don't have money laying around either for the most part. A few companies do, um, like Apple, for example, but that's, that's rare. So ultimately, even Amazon borrows money. So they would build something. Suddenly there's you know, a plot of land, nothing's there, uh, and they would build something because uh, they're taking a risk. Uh, there's no ecosystem like you have in a city like San Francisco or New York, where if you build something, there's already population, there's already people of money that's with disposable income, there's already an, an educated workforce that you can pull from uh, that's consistently proven over time, there's low insurance rates, all these things, all these data points are important in, in determining where to build something new if you want to stay there for a long time. Uh, Starbucks, for example, rarely shuts down stores. I mean, it's just to give you an idea of how it's a little bit easier, obviously, when you're building a smaller um, edifice versus a bigger one. Uh, but there's a lot of di different things that go into this analysis. And so, and we're getting a little bit off track and I apologize, but ultimately the question is, you know, I'm going to spend this money, a billion dollars, but I have to pay taxes. Once I've got property taxes, I've got water fees, I've got all this other stuff that I'm going to have to pay you, the city, to make sure this thing works. So you're going to, you know, if you want me to come here, what I you know, I'm going to promise you that I'm going to put 10,000 people on this building and give them jobs because you can't do that. You, the city council, you can't do that. You, the state, you can't do that. I can. 
Um, and I can do that because I have a competitive advantage over, you know, something, right? Or I, or I have a product that's in demand that I've come up with on my own, uh, presumably. Although so many people copy these days, you know, it's very difficult to call anybody original. So I come in, I build that, I spend the money in a billion dollars, I take a risk. I, when my tax bill comes due, the city says, all right, I'm going to give you a credit um, up to a certain amount. Um, and so you, you, you would have had a tax bill of a, of a million dollars. That tax bill for the first either usually five years uh, or three or sometimes seven or more, depending on how big that project is, is zero. So whatever you have to pay in taxes, we will agree that you essentially waive it. And again, the idea being that there's nothing there. Now there's a building. Now there's people in there that will pay taxes um, and pay gas fees, which, you know, gas, by the way, has, you know, a lot of taxes, both federal and state. Um, suddenly, you know, there's little coffee shops that go around there. Uh, all of a sudden you have, a, you have something there that wasn't there before. Now, a couple of problems with this. Number one, when on day one, when you agree to a deal like this, you don't actually know how many employees you need. The market fluctuates, um, as we saw in 2008 and 2009. On day one, and this happened in Wisconsin, on day one, uh, you might, you know, be a company that needs 25,000 people, but it, it's possible that you don't actually need that many people. You're just making a guess, right? So come in year five or year two, or even in six months, you know, six months later, you decide that, well, actually, now that we've done this, now that we know exactly what we need, we don't need 25,000 employees. We need 10. And so that's one of the problems, you know, the, the difficulty in aligning expectations. Now, the EU, in many cases, has a penalty where they fine companies in certain circumstances. Now, let's just, you know, I don't know the details, so let's just speak in the abstract, where if you agree to a deal, uh, either a takeover of a company, um, and you don't maintain the number of, number of employees, where in some cases, you, when you buy out a company in Europe, you have to promise to hire more people, uh, or at least maintain employees, or at least not lay them off. And if you do that, there's a fine. There's a huge penalty. And part of that penalty goes to the government. Um, and part of it, you know, is a disincentive um, to, to say that, listen, you may not know exactly. You, you are taking a risk, uh, but so are we. We have a plot of land. We can give that to somebody else. You're not the only game in town. That's, by the way, this is why private sector is so important. Um, and so, you know, because you want a growing private sector so other companies can compete with each other um, as opposed to just having one company with all the money. Um, so ultimately... You know, the idea is, you know, we also have something of value. We have an educated workforce. We have people here that are good workers. Um, you know, we have a consistent, um, such, you know, we have a safe population, a safe place. So it's, it's supposed to be a two-way street. Now, number one, again, the expectations are not aligned. The EU tries to make, put the burden or the onus on the company and says, look, you're the one with the information. You've got the land. You're, you're the one telling us you're going to give us 25,000 jobs. If you don't give us 25,000 jobs, you've got six months to make it up. Um, and if you don't get to that number over a certain period of time, then we are going to simply fine you. And that fine will, you know, go into the creation of jobs or will go into a severance package. And on top of that, it'll be a penalty so that, you know, you, you, we are, we benefit from, um, essentially it's not a windfall per se. Um, you know, but ultimately we want a situation where it is a win-win situation, uh, for everyone. Um, and again, you're the one, the company that's telling us you're going to give us X if you don't. You know, it's on you. So in some cases, like in like Wisconsin, uh, companies did, international companies did offer to create a, a facility and give 10,000 jobs. That eventually came out to be something like in the hundreds uh, because of shifting p politics. Uh, a lot of different things, again, go into these situations, especially if it's international, uh, coming in and doing um, FDI, foreign direct investment. So that's one of the problems. The second problem is, you know, all these deals never usually don't factor in things like city planning. Sure, there's a plot of land and there's nothing there. Sure, there's going to be suddenly a building there and hopefully a baseball field and so on. But what about parking? What about affordable housing? Uh, what about pollution? None of these things are typically negotiated because they're outside the scope of the agreement. And furthermore, you know, if, if you're going to, you know, Amazon's not in the business of building parking lots. It's, it's not in the business of city planning. You know, so it, it justifiably can say, listen, you know, we don't know how to build cities. We know how to build what we do, which is to be the number one an online retailer. We have no idea this is really on you. Here's what we need to be successful. If you have something else you want to do, you can submit a plan. But, you know, if somebody else on the other side in another city is, is submitting something that, that's, you know, more cost effective, why would we choose you? And why would we give people in your city or your county or your state 
uh, you know, 10,000 or 20,000 jobs? Why would we give you the opportunity if what you're doing makes no sense? And this is one of the problems is that cities, for the most part, don't know how to plan. Uh, you see this most egregiously in other countries, but it's all over the world. Um, and most cities, even if they have a planning commission, it's all about building safety. It's not about an overall format for how to create a walkable, friendly, pedestrian friendly, uh, or just a livable city where the quality of life is something that is uh, acceptable to everyone involved. And part of that, again, is because cities have gone in debt. They've, they've promised too many things to too many people. And so that core function of city planning has actually gone away. They don't really have architects. They don't really have visions anymore. And everywhere you go in the world, they've outsourced city planning city planning to developers. That's why almost everywhere you go in America, you've got these, these big box retailers, whether you go to Texas or California, they're everywhere. Some, and the cities that, where you don't see that are the ones that are constrained by their size, like San Francisco can't have a huge Walmart. It's already got too many small buildings. It's got a lot of old Victorian houses. Uh, it can't do that. So one of the problems is, is, again, that the government has been inept in terms of city planning. So that gives corporations an advantage uh, when the government is inept. So these are the issues we ought to be talking about. And I've spoken too long, so I'll stop pretty soon. Uh, but no one's talking about these issues. But the first thing we have to understand is, you know, what are the incentives? How do you make how do you, you know, make sure there's acceptable risk on both sides? And what are the penalties and procedures for enforcing those uh, for enforcing a situation where the expectations are not met? Uh, if we can do that. Um, and then again, that's a bigger issue, a much bigger issue than, you know, simply, you know, how much money is going back and forth? What is the tax revenue? It's really about how do we build cities? How do we create public pri private partnerships? And if, if we don't want to have that model, what is the other model we want? Is it the Singaporean model? Is it the Chinese model, which is similar to Singapore in some cities? Uh, what is it exactly? And a lot of politicians say, well, listen, you know, there's money everywhere. I, I look at I look at the military budget, it keeps going up every year. If we really wanted to do something like um, you know, a, a, a deal to help the environment, we can do it. So, but ultimately that sort of, you know, that part of that again goes back to the government being inept in terms of, you know, not having a balanced budget on the federal side. Um, and, you know, you have a lot of different dislocations and people can justifiably say, listen, you know, if you can do this, if you can get what you want um, by any means necessary, then so can I. And it doesn't matter if, you know, who has to pay that debt. It doesn't matter because we can print our own money. So even if a foreign country buys up all the bonds that we issue, um, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, if you if you are going to print all the money you want to get whatever it is you want done in foreign affairs or in any other issue, uh, then why can't we do that on the local level or on a bigger scale as well for all the things that we want for social welfare? That's a good question. And I think it's something that more, that more Americans ought to be asking themselves. Uh, but it shouldn't be a situation where we're confused about the economic side of the equation, about where that money is coming from and about what the real issues are.